Good morning to everyone. So we're going to start this morning section. As you know, we're going to have two plenary talks now. And the first plenary talk will be given by Dr. Patrick Ross. He is uh, one of the pillars of uh, photodynamic therapy. He's been visiting us and motivating us for a long time. And uh, today he'll be talking to us about PDT in thoracic oncology, a pathway to future utilization. He is from Ohio State. And uh, so please, you have your 30 minutes. Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Vandra, thank you so much. Um, just want to make a couple of comments for those of you who uh, survived that fantastic party that, uh, that we had last night. Uh, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and meet good friends and, and share good times. And I want to thank uh, the IPA uh, for the opportunity to participate in, uh, in a leadership role with them. To, uh, to help guide our society in the future, and I hope I can uh, do nearly half as good a job as Sam did as, uh, in his role. So Sam, congratulations and to you, and thank you for letting me carry the baton. So we've, um, we've heard a lot about uh, photodynamic therapy, but, and I expected to talk a lot about photodynamic therapy, but what I didn't realize is that I was going to get a tutorial in surgery last night this is, uh, you can see Colin is not quite comfortable with the way that that man is wielding that machete that's, uh, that's carving the meat. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's really important to remember that, that there are many people that have made this happen and I appreciate the chance to be part of it. So this room represents the future, uh, but in thoracic oncology, and what I do with PDT in the lung and the esophagus really stands on the shoulders of so many other physicians and investigators before me, including especially uh, my good friend, Professor Cato. And uh, his work in this area was seminal and uh, will hardly ever be, uh, it's hard to replicate, but we hope to carry forward. As I mentioned yesterday, I do <coughs> some uh, disclosures for, uh, disclosure for, because I do consulting for uh, Pinnacle and have research grants from them. So lung cancer is one of those diseases which is so critically important to our future because it could become one of the real uh, corners on which PDT is built. And it shows up in a lot of different ways, as you know. So this cancer, right up here against the mediastinum, this, is, this cancer has uh, obstructed the right upper lobe orifice, so this triangle is a completely collapsed right upper lobe that we can open up with PDT. This is a poor man who has no left lung and who has a new cancer in the only part of his right lung that is still working. We're challenged here, but in the future that may be amenable to percutaneous ablative technology with PDT or navigational bronchoscopy. And then, of course, the more common scenario where this patient who presented popping up blood, and uh, that symptom can easily be controlled with PDT. So um, what I wanted to uh, talk about is that one of the common, one of the common problems that, we're, that we face is that we're told that PDT is very expensive. And uh, I just want to uh, show you that, that there are many other ways that we treat lung cancer. And this is this is just a, a short video clip of uh, my preferred way when I'm not using PDT for lung cancer, I use robotic surgery for lung cancer. And uh, this is looking through, uh, through the Da Vinci robot and I'm cleaning up the fissure over the pulmonary artery. And we talk about PDT and the cost of the drug and the drug is $19,000 a vial in the US. But this robot with which I do this operation costs $2.1 million. So when we think about the cost of PDT as an oncology tool, we really have to, uh, we have to keep it in the perspective of, of what that really means. So I would be, I'll be happy to share other home family videos with you at any time, but 
this is, uh, this is what that machine looks like. So the console where the surgeon sits and then the, uh, the four arms at the bedside. So this is what we're really most interested in, right? How, do we, how are we going to take this lesion, which is visible here under white light, visible here under fluorescence, and in my practice, we put a fiber adjacent to that and we treat it with, uh, with the light therapy. And here, this is a lesion that's going to become increasingly important to us because lung cancer screening for early lung cancers is now being covered by insurance companies in the United States. And lung cancer screening has been demonstrated to reduce the risk of dying from lung cancer by up to 20% and it's finding these small peripheral nodules, which now we operate on, but in the future, we may be able to apply ablative technology, and I hope that PDT becomes one of those platforms. So, why am I interested? Well, my whole role in becoming a surgeon is to not use the machete that that, that, that waiter used on the steaks last night, but to use minimally invasive technology. And in minimally invasive technology, we can either do smaller resections and save lung, we can use the robot and make small ports instead of making big incisions, or we can go through the bronchoscope, and now with the navigational bronchoscopy or elect, uh, the magnetic bronchoscopy, we can get further out into the periphery and do not only diagnosis and staging, but hopefully effective therapy. But, it, but if it were that way, then every patient in every center would get offered PDT. And they're not. And here are some of the roadblocks. So their caregivers, the primary care docs, are not familiar with PDT. It's not a consistent part of our medical radiation or surgical oncology training programs. And there's some misperception about how complex it is, how cumbersome it is. And most importantly, there's a total misperception of what the complications are. So I have found PDT to be extremely valuable in thoracic oncology. And it's, a fa it's a valuable because unlike some of the targeted therapies for which you have to have a particular mutational profile, PDT seems to be effective across all cell types. And it's not just effective in the central airways, it's effective in the periphery, it's effective in the esophagus, and it's not just effective for obstruction. It's bleeding, it is, uh, it is recurrence, it is early cancer, it is palliation for late cancer, so a variety of scenarios. And unlike radiation, which has a limit to how much radiation you can receive, photodynamic therapy can be repeated. And that's very important for us as patients have an, a long timeline of disease. And as I'll show you, it's associated with low morbidity and mortality. And the patients appreciate getting the therapy. So <clears throat> my team uh, did the first PDT procedure in, uh, at Ohio State in 1998. And right now, our, we use this for lung cancer, esophageal cancer, high-grade dysplasia, tumors that are metastatic to the airway, recurrent breast cancer, which has been refractory to radiation, early laryngeal cancers, and some non-malignant uh, uh, papillomatosis, and a new trial for cholangiocarcinoma. Right now, we have trials, an immunobiology trial in lung, randomized trial in cholangiocarcinoma, and a proof of principle trial using a new device in, uh, in breast cancer. And we're engaged in outcome studies, which I will discuss, and we have a basic science lab looking at T cell as a mechanism of action in immunomodulation. So we have a real program, and it's taken a while to get there. And what that has allowed us is to now have a whole concept of photodynamic medicine where we're not only palliating, but we're often curative resections. And we started off, like everyone else, with symptom management. And the symptom management is exquisite. If you have an obstructing cancer and you put a fiber into it, it melts away. But symptom management is not going to get us where we want to be as an organization and as treating physicians. And what we have to do is demonstrate where it is for curative intent. And curative intent might be something as simple as this. So this, uh, this patient has here under white light and here under fluorescence. Oh, I did the same thing yesterday. 
the learning curve is short. So um, under autofluorescence, that patient has an early lung cancer for which PDT may be the only therapy offered, and we do this on a regular basis. And this is another example of that early central cancer where the fiber is adjacent to it and treated. But the buzzword in oncology is not single therapy. The buzzword is multimodality, and that's what everyone wants. How do we combine all of the therapeutic options that we have to go ahead and give a patient the optimal therapy for their disease? And PDT has a role there, okay? And, and it's a role in several ways. So this patient came to us with this obstructing lesion, which uh, is just poised to be penetrated by this fiber. We cause a little bit of bleeding, but it's of no consequence. And here's the right main stem, here's the left main stem. Now there's probably residual tumor here. And this patient then went on, after being treated with that, to definitive chemo and radiation. And this is what it looks like. When you have a completely obstructed main stem, you get no air in the right lung. But two days into the therapy, there's some patchy atelectasis, but the rest of it's expanded. And at the end of the course of therapy, which is about five days for us, two applications of light, three bronchoscopies, you have a completely expanded lung, the infection is cleared, and you're able to treat. And it's not just for main stem obstruction. This patient has an obstructing lesion within a segment of the upper lobe on the left side. Two open segments, one occluded segment, presented with a cancer, which is here, and an, a lung abscess with an air fluid level. That patient went on to be treated with PDT and then chemotherapy for induction and then resected. And in this striking example of a very complex problem, central tumor, occlusion up to the carina, mediastinal adenopathy. And this patient had what for us is now a very standard plan of photodynamic therapy for endoluminal disease with chemotherapy to melt away this tumor. Here's the carina. Here's the cancer. This is what it looks like after PDT. And the patient went on then to have chemotherapy, then surgical resection with a right pneumonectomy, negative margin, survived four and a half years with a stage 3B non-small cell lung cancer. So who is the perfect PDT patient? Well, in my practice, it, uh, it can be anyone who shows up with a lung cancer and a symptom. And we consider, how can we use PDT? But in fact, these are some characteristics. So you have to be able to get there with the endoscope. Now I'm, I'm generic about that because the navigational bronchoscope with that extended working channel is now allowing us to go much further out into the lung. And quite frankly, we can reach the periphery with the navigational bronchoscope. So that's why instead of saying central, I say accessible by the bronchoscope. There has to be a defined extent of disease and you have to be able to know that you're seeing the proximal end of it, and you know that beyond it, the lumen is open and the distal is controllable. It'd be great if they had minimal medical comorbidities, but that's not who gets sent to us for PDT. We get the patients who are old, the octogenarians, um, have significant heart disease, have significant renal dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction, those sorts of cases. Have to be capable of understanding and adhering to the light precautions. They have to be stable as an outpatient. So we talked yesterday as a small group that we have to be sensitive to the economics of medicine. And in the United States, photodynamic therapy is done as an outpatient is actually a profit center for the hospital. But done as an inpatient becomes a loss because of the DRGs associated with it. And as always, the perfect patient is someone who has health insurance in the United States, and uh, not always the case. So here, here we have a non-small cell cancer in the right upper lobe, bleeding, perfect candidate for PDT. And you might offer it to the patient. Why do they decline? Well, here's what you might hear. They've, all they hear about is the photosensitivity. You talk to them about uh, things and then they get on the websites and they learn about the photosensitivity and it scares them away. Or <clears throat> the fact is is that we offer chemotherapy, uh, we offer photodynamic therapy, 
but the radiation oncologist says, no, 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 no. You, you need to come for radiation because this is a standard and PDT is an unproven technology as we've heard and, and Dr. Bowen in his great talk talked about how we have not done randomized trials yet to prove equivalency or even more efficacy with PDT compared to other standard therapies. And sometimes they're concerned about the fact that they have to have a diagnostic endoscopy, then their first therapeutic endoscopy, then another one to clear the airways, and then a final one to evaluate, and then perhaps one at eight or 10 weeks to be sure that in fact they, we have accomplished the goal and have cleared everything that we want out of the airways. But here are the reasons that patients select photodynamic therapy. Patients become enamored of the fact that this is innovative technology. It's not new to us, and all of us know how it works and why it works. Maybe we don't understand it as fully as we need to, and that's why the great basic scientists in the world are trying to help sort that out. But we get it, and the patients think it's innovative. And because they haven't heard about it from their other caregivers, it becomes an advantage for us when we introduce it. They go to the websites, and instead of focusing on the photosensitivity, they go to those websites that have great patient stories, right? Because if you read about a patient who had, as my patient with that crinal mass was told by his doctors, you have six months to live, you have stage 3B, non-small cell lung cancer, you need to go pack your bags, go to Rio, and, and that's where you need to be. They don't want that. What they want is to go to the websites and read about, I had stage 3B, non-small cell lung cancer, inoperable because of its location. It was made smaller with photodynamic therapy. I had an operation, and I had four and a half years with my family that I would not have had with other therapy. That's what the patients want to read. And in my community now, uh, it's recommended by the oncologist. The oncologist now become one of my great referrals. Rather than, than not knowing about it, we've taken the time to educate the oncologist in the community about what an awesome technique this is and how it can impact their patient's future. And it is minimally invasive. So when, when a patient gets offered anything, and I, I do hundreds of operations every year, and, and most of them involve an incision. So, so last year I did 820 procedures. Only 520 of them were photodynamic therapy. So it's less than 10% of my, of my time. But the fact is, is that when you tell patients you don't have to make an incision, they're all about it. They enjoy that. So what we did <clears throat> is we got an interested community together. And uh, we call ourselves, uh, because you have to have an acronym, right, PORT. So PDT Outcomes Research Team. And uh, the, pr the goal here, compare short and long-term clinical outcomes for patients with lung and esophageal cancers treated with PDT. Rather than stay in our silos in our universities, pool existing institutional data from everyone's retrospective cases. And then the key here is to enroll patients prospectively. So to partner in these outcomes analyses. And the strategy is really quite simple, to leverage the aggregated data so that we can stratify these patients by stage, by cell type, by mutational analysis, by prior or concurrent therapy. And then, because it isn't a randomized trial, to utilize the existing administrative databases to develop our comparison cohorts. And in that way, try to demonstrate the efficacy of PDT in both short and long-term oncologic value. Our objectives, first, to define safety. Second, to analyze the efficacy. Third, to look at patterns of management of thoracic malignancies. And then, for us, all of these, all of these listed here, right? How do, we control, how do we control presenting symptoms? How do we manage early stage? How do we evaluate PDT when used with radiation surgery or chemotherapy? What is the morbidity and mortality? And then the most important question for us in oncology, 
what is the survival data? What are the long-term oncologic outcomes? So this, uh, this group of, uh, of the five of us got together, and uh, this is uh, now on the map. Uh, and, and then, in a year, it looked like this. And then, it looks like this. And the most important one is this is what it will look like this year. So you can see, um, and I know the, the writing is too, we have Providence Histon, Cedar sinai in California, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, Oshner down in New Orleans, University of Alabama, Emory University, Duke University, Allegheny Health, University of Pittsburgh, University of Chicago, University of Wisconsin, coming down here, Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, uh, going out here to the uh, 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 Columbus, Indiana, uh, looking at that medical center, and of course, Ohio State University, and we're adding one in Philadelphia at my new home, which is uh, Brent Blankenom Research Medical Institute. And of course, as is important, uh, you have to have camaraderie. Uh, this is our investigator meeting this year. Not nearly as much fun as the dinner last night, but we got through it. And uh, this is a, uh, a slide with uh, my co-PIs. So Dr. Wahidi, Dr. Bryant, Dr. Bashar, Dr. Lowen, uh, names that you will remember. Panather, uh, Dr. Hogarth at Chicago, names that you might know from your own collaborations. And the timeline. So in 2010, it was a concept. In 2011, we built a web-based platform. In 2012, we formed our first contracts. 2013, the retrospective data went in. We spent much of 2014 making the map look better by recruiting additional sites. And now this year, we're into prospective entry because all the retrospective data is in. And, by two, and we have now engaged um, some folks who are going to help us with the SEER database to do the comparative analyses for our cohort analysis. Some of you are in this picture, and you might remember talking about this at Ohio State in 2012 and, uh, and where it can go. And that's why it's so nice for me to be able uh, to bring this here. So what have we accomplished? Well. Um, we have 827 retrospective cases available for review, 174 prospective cases so far, which of course for us is the nugget because what we want is the contemporaneous uh, material. And if we look at the breakdown, it's 573 patients uh, for lung, and here are the stages. So here we have, this is um, advanced stage, stage four and stage three B. It's more than half of the experience because unfortunately, people still view PDT as a palliative intervention. But all of these folks here, the in situs, the ones, the twos, and the three A's, these are all patients with curative intent, where PDT is not done for palliation, but for cure. And I mentioned that as repeatable. So in our group, the big blue is the majority of the cases one time, but 12% had a second treatment, and 2% uh, had a third treatment, and then we call these our frequent flyers, where if you get five courses of therapy, the sixth one is free, okay? So what about uh, the survival? Well, I think this is pretty good, right? So as a single modality, a single therapy, we had 98 patients with stage 3B who lived almost a year, 45 patients who had recurrence and got treated twice during their, and lived over a year. Um, that's incredible for stage four patients in uh, um, the 260 days. What about in the esophagus? Well, here we have, again, the palliative patients in stage four, high-grade dysplasia, stage one, stage two, stage three. All of these patients are all done with curative intent. And in the esophagus, a bit more common, 14% of the patients had a second treatment. The majority had one treatment. So it's great, right? So we sit here and we say, yes, you can recruit these patients, and yes, you can you can get good outcomes, but I want to show you just how good the outcomes are. So photosensitivity, 1,002 patients in the database, 12 patients, 12 out of 1,000 patients had phototoxicity. That is not yet anything that is reported in the literature, and that is a phenomenal outcome, and it's because of the great patient education we do, and I have some of my team with me that helps do that great patient education. Stricture in the esophagus, eight times. Strictures in the lung, none, okay? Perforations, one in the esophagus, none in the airway. 
And if you, but we do have some dysphagia. We have had to dilate. We have had to put stents. So of the 480 esophageal patients, yeah, about 20% of them have dysphagia that has to be managed. And about 25 of the 500 lung patients had significant dyspnea that required additional bronchoscopies, hospitalizations, and interventions. But 5% is really not, not very much. So where does that take us? Because I'm sure I'm out of time, and if I'm over, I apologize. PDT from thoracic malignancy is the road ahead because I am, I am so passionate and so upbeat about where PDT will be in thoracic oncology that I want to tell you that we're going to change how it's viewed. PDT has a real role here. So what are we going to demonstrate through this combined registry and comparing to the, the databases? I think that we're going to demonstrate that PDT as an, is going to be the ablative therapy of choice based on the outcomes that we can demonstrate by pooling our patient experience. I think that we're going to learn that we can combine PDT into multimodality therapy so that we can use PDT to control the local, therapy, local symptoms while we give systemic therapy with chemotherapy. And then we're going to learn further things from our basic scientists about how to augment what we know is an immunomodulating event that happens with photodynamic therapy so that we gain even further systemic control and that this becomes a critical, not only a luxury, but a critical, essential part of oncologic management. And I think that in patients who have medically inoperable situations, that PDT is going to be demonstrated to be the ablative therapy of choice, and that's what we want to show. And what we know now is that we're going to be able to utilize PDT for, for plural-based malignancies. We're going to be able to use PDT for peripheral lung cancers. There's going to be some real opportunity for good clinical projects ahead of us. So <clears throat> I am a thoracic surgeon, and I will die with my scalpel in my hand like all the other surgeons in the room. So at the top of the pile is surgical resection. But in a biblical sense, PDT sits at the right hand, okay? And, uh, and PDT will always be important as part of what we do. All of the other modalities factor in because multidisciplinary care is critical. So as I've mentioned uh, to my friends, when I need photodynamic therapy, I light my fire pit in Wyoming, and this is my photodynamic therapy. But, uh, but the real future of PDT is sitting in this room um, I had an awesome time at the party last night. Thank you very much for the chance to be here. I think that the future is not only looking good, but I think it's bright. And I look forward to partnering with many of you on projects in the future. Thank you very much. So we have time for one, two questions. Okay. I'll ask as a scientist ignorant of all of this. So, why, um, you know, uh, Cato predicted 10 years ago, he told me that because of the surveillance and everything, you know, peripheral lung disease will be discovered early and PDT will have. But w what is it, a turf issue that you, that you as a surgeon can't do the peripheral? Uh, so, uh, so disease. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, so the <clears throat> I think PDT for peripheral lung cancers will follow um, where we went with SBRT. So when you have a peripheral lung cancer, now with new technology, the robot, yeah, yeah. we can operate on almost anyone in a minimally invasive fashion. But the fact is, is that there are still some patients who meet the criteria of medically inoperable. Right now. Um, because of the resources poured in to SBRT, SBRT is the procedure of choice for managing the medically inoperable patient. The ablative technologies could not generate the necessary proof of safety because the studies weren't done that you could both get a margin around it and that you could safely do it without causing bleeding or bronchopleural fistulas. So the science did not move ahead fast enough. But right now, 
There's a group in New York who's done some great work with it. Um, they're, they're certainly around the world in Japan, but we haven't put enough resource into it. Okay, so just a, uh, a quick comment uh, on, uh, so I, it's just my plea of what I did in my talk to treat PDT as an only an ablative therapy and have chemo be the second, uh, a different component. I really think we should look at those two together because PDT sensitizes many, many, in many cases, cells to chemo. So that time interval is so dramatically important right. that, so, uh, yeah. So we start our chemotherapy within two weeks of doing the PDT treatment. Because we right. Think it's I guess you can do it earlier, but earlier would be hugely different. I can almost bet on that. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. This is amazing stuff, but I feel I have to be a little bit of the devil's advocate sure. because I know what will happen in the UK. They say yes, you get brilliant palliation with the PDT, but doing it with a thermal laser, with the YAG laser, you can get this equally good recanalization with a much simpler procedure. And also, this, what uh, Tayyab has just said about, when you said about combining PDT with chemotherapy, our ethics committee wouldn't let us do them within a month of each other. Right. This wasn't on pulmonary stuff, this was on the pancreas. Yeah. So there's a lot of anxiety there, and I think a lot of it is vested interests from the chemotherapy doctors. So, so there's a lot of anxiety and there's no evidence, and, uh, and, then, and that's what we need to do. And it won't come from any single group. But as you saw, we're, by the end of this year, we're going to have 20 centers in the U.S. And if we could gain external funding, not only do we want to collect the results, but we also want to collect the specimens. Because we think that this is a chance to capture the largest repository of past specimens on PDT-treated patients so that the Tayabas of the world can do the basic science on those specimens and see what the impact really has been. Can I just say, we still haven't got the controlled, randomized studies comparing other I, techniques. I accept that, and that's why we're doing the poor man's choice of comparing to the data, well, to see your database. The beginning. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay, we have one more question. First of all, I confirm, at least for our territory, the French one, uh, the problem will be exactly the same than the one uh, that uh, Steve will meet in the United Kingdom. Uh, congratulations for the registry. Uh, you remember that we have tried to do that in Europe uh, several years ago, but uh, it all failed out and uh, went away when uh, Photofreno was sold. Uh, oncology, uh, uh, the relationship with the oncologist. Uh, you are lucky because talking to an oncologist about PDT, in, uh, at least in France, is impossible. So we have to fight against the oncologist and not work together with them. It's a very strong opposition, at least in France. I don't know UK, but uh, in France it's nearly impossible. Well, we're all about building the alliances, building the teams. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's thank again Professor Rosie.